Dear Life. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to I Focus Online, the lecture 116 and glaucoma se uh, session 20. And today we have Dr. Gauri Murthy with us and who will be talking on glaucomas associated with ocular inflammation. I request Dr. Vanita Patakri, ma'am, to please introduce Dr. Gauri Murthy. Thanks very much, Rolika. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Gauri Murthy here today. She's Senior Consultant uh, uh, Glaucoma at the uh, Prabha Eye Clinic and the Vittal International Institute of Ophthalmology. She has been uh, very busy academically. Uh, she has published widely and has presented in national and international uh, meetings. She's also received uh, best paper awards at uh, Glaucoma Society of India annual conferences. And she has great experience in handling refractory and difficult glaucomas, uh, not only by implants, but also endoscopic surgery and uh, also glaucoma in infants and children. Um, it, uh, we uh, uh, extend a very warm welcome to you. Team CFS is very grateful that you could take the time out to speak to us on glaucomas that are associated with ocular inflammation. All yours now. Thank you. Thanks for that generous introduction, Dr. Vanita and uh, Dr. Harsh and Dr. Vyas. Uh, uh, I'm grateful for the invitation to be at this uh, uh, meeting. So the uh, uh, topic given to me today is uh, glaucomas associated with ocular inflammation. So without much ado, we'll uh, go on to that. So basically when we say uh, uh, glaucomas associated with uh, uh, inflammation, most of the times it is uveitic glaucoma apart from a very small subset associated with scleritis and other things. So I'm going to concentrate mainly upon the uveitic glaucoma. So we all know that uh, uveitis, there is uh, definitely a, a, an incidence of raised intraocular pressure and the uveitis is the second most common underlying disease process leading to secondary glaucomas. The first most common is associated with cataract and post-cataract surgeries. So about 10% of patients with uveitis go on to develop glaucoma and certain subsets of uveitis, it's much more. So anterior uveitis, older age at presentation and chronic inflammation, these are the factors associated with a higher prevalence of uveitic glaucoma. So we need to be clear when we are talking about uh, uveitic glaucoma, there is one subset which is called uveitis related ocular hypertension where it is just the intraocular pressure which is high and there are no optic nerve head changes, glaucomatous changes or visual field changes. So this is called as uveitis related ocular hypertension. When the optic nerve starts to show definite glaucomatous changes which are reflected in the fields as well, we term it as uveitic glaucoma. So when we are thinking about classifying uh, uveitic glaucoma, we can classify it based on the mechanism of the glaucoma and the cause of the uveitis. The most common one is based on the angle structure where the mechanism is whether it is open angle or angle closure and based on the course where it is involved with an acute uveitis or a chronic uveitis and based on the pathology of uveitis, whether it's non-granulomatous or granulomatous, and based on the severity, where it is hypertensive uveitis or post-inflammatory glaucoma, and based on the cause of the uveitis, which can be infectious, autoimmune, systemic, or idiopathic. The alternate or more accepted classification is inflammatory ocular hypertension syndrome, where it is just the IOP which is raised in an acute way. And this occurs in herpetic anterior uveitis, cytomegalovirus infection, sarcoidosis, toxoplasmosis, and post nash lossman syndrome. There's another subset where it is called acute uveitic angle closure, either due to pupillary block or other mechanisms. And a third subset where it is corticosteroid-induced ocular hypertension or glaucoma associated with uveitis. And a fourth where a lot of mechanisms play a role, which is chronic mixed mechanism ocular hypertension or glaucoma. So whatever it is, we just need to understand that both open angle and closed angle, there are certain factors which lead to raised intraocular pressure. So if the angle is open, the factors which could be contributing could be increased viscosity of the aqueous humor, 
obstruction of the trabecular meshwork by inflammatory cells and debris and there may be swelling and dysfunction of the trabecular meshwork associated with inflammation and the liberation of active substances such as prostaglandins may also play a role and this kind of long term inflammation can cause scarring of the outflow channels and decreased facility of outflow even though the angle may be open coming to the angle closure mechanism sometimes there is development of a cuticular endothelial membrane over the angle formation of pas many times which is broad like this and formation of new blood vessels like this pupillary block causing secondary angle closure and sometimes forward displacement of the lens iris diaphragm due to a subclinical uveal effusion this happens very commonly in vkh and formation of pas like multiple mechanisms may work simultaneously okay so uh, that is something that we need to remember so let's go on to specific uveitic entities which are associated with glaucoma so the first one which i'll discuss is fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis so this is typically described as a unilateral uveitis which is associated with a change in iris color a low grade uveitis and uh, it is non granulomatous type of uveitis so usually this is of insidious onset occurring in the 20 to 45 year old age group though it is mostly unilateral in 13% of patients it can be bilateral so typically there are no synecae and uh, there is heterochromia so you can see here this is the one eye of the patient and this is the other eye the patient who has fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis you can look at the iris surface here it's a little you know different when compared to this so that that is what causes the heterochromia there is a low grade anterior chamber reaction and diffuse small stellate capes cataract is also associated and secondary open angle type of glaucoma is the one which is associated the inflammation is typically non responsive to steroids and uh, viral causes like rubella and even toxoplasmosis has been implicated in the causation so another thing which can happen is while you are doing gonioscopy or you do a paracentesis for uh, taking an ac tap for pcr sometimes you can see this small high femur like you can see over here this is known as amsler sign so this fine new blood vessels which are there in the angle they uh, can bleed when you have a pressure on the eye or sudden decompression so this is known as amsler sign and vitreous cells and cataract definitely and glaucoma is the main cause of visual morbidity in this type of uveitis controlling the inflammation here has little or no effect on the iop and uh, uh, avoid unnecessary steroid use see the tendency is to go on giving steroids and this causes uh, steroid induced glaucoma and that doesn't help the the steroids don't help the inflammation much as well because low grade inflammation is persistent in this type of uveitis so one should avoid unnecessary steroid use aqueous suppressants may be effective initially like timolol or uh, dorsolamide or brenzolamide and even brimonidine but sometimes this type of uh, secondary glaucoma is relatively resistant to medical therapy and surgery may be necessary the current concept is also to look for viral causes for this uh, as the herpetic virus has been implicated in the pathogenesis of this type of uh, uveitic glaucoma so if you find a definite pcr positive and uh, you can treat it with antivirals which can reduce the severity of the uh, systemic antivirals which can reduce the severity of the uh, disease process the next uh, uh, complex of uh, this thing uh, uveitic glaucoma is posner schlossman syndrome or what we would call glaucomatocyclitic crisis here typically there are recurrent episodes of acutely raised iop in young to middle aged people it is a unilateral non granulomatous anterior uveitis so you will just have like one single kp like you are seeing over here and a raised iop to the extent of 40 to 50 and uh, this is uh, you know there are no pas and the angle is quite open so this is the typical presentation of posner schlossman syndrome the herpetic virus and certain hla associations certain gi diseases and various allergic factors are implicated 
in the pathogenesis of this uh, syndrome the management is by aqueous suppressants and steroids generally it, it is very amenable to treatment and quickly responds so what is proposed is that there is a vascular incompetence in the eye which leads to a release of prostaglandins which cause inflammation and a rise in intraocular pressure but these are all hypotheses and not proved also a uh, supporter for this hypothesis is that when you give prostaglandin inhibitors like oral endomethacin and uh, uh, you know a drug called subconjunctival polyfluoroethylin which is not available with us it lowers the iop so therefore a real release of prostaglandins has been implicated in the inflammation and the rise in intraocular pressure the prognosis for control of iop as i told you earlier is very good and only in 25% of the cases if unrecognized and untreated patients will go on to have glaucomatous damage the other cause of secondary glaucoma which is a little less common in our uh, population we don't see too many of these is juvenile idiopathic arthritis up to 42% of patients with gia go on to develop glaucoma so here again you have to recognize the glaucoma and treat it and the inflammation has to be treated in a step ladder fashion with topical or local steroids immunosuppressants and now biologics as well surgical management will be very frequently needed and this subset respond even to goniotomy so even goniotomy is a viable treatment option for this subset of uveitic glaucoma the next very common subset that we see which has a lot of visual morbidity is viral uveitis and glaucoma this can be a very difficult secondary glaucoma to treat so typically there is an acute increase in iop in the presence of an acute active iridocyclitis anterior iridocyclitis and 28 to 45% of people with this kind of herpetic uveitis develop transient elevated intraocular pressure and 10 to 54% may present with secondary glaucoma so apart from the herpes simplex virus herpes zoster and cytomegalovirus have also been implicated so in the acute phase it is the trabeculitis which causes the raised intraocular pressure and it is the cynical angle closure so when you suspect a herpetic keratouveitis an ac tap pcr for viral dna what we call as a fuchs profile is very very important and necessary so that you can zero in on the cause if you have a definite pcr positive and the clinical picture is one of a viral uveitis or a keratouveitis systemic antivirals which are given long term like acyclovir valacyclovir or famcyclovir can go a long way in effectively managing the condition topical antiviral therapy is indicated in patients with keratouveitis because when you use a topical steroid treatment you should prevent the viral replication or the reactivation of the virus in the cornea but in a pure herpetic uveitis topical antiviral is not required so let's just go ahead with a case which will illustrate how these patients present so this patient of mine is a 50 year old uh, she was at that time uh, this is about uh, 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 10 years back so she complained of recurrent episodes of anterior uveitis in her left eye her first episode was in 2005 and she had many repeat episodes in 2008 to 10 and she is also noted to be a steroid responder so her bcva was 6 by 6 a cornea in the left eye showed keratot uh, keratic precipitate flare and cells this is her left eye and uh, this is her right eye you can see that the iris surface is mottled the pupils were round regular and reactive slight larger pupil on the left eye when compared to the right eye angle was open and the disc was normal but the intraocular pressure was 38 mm of mercury with maximal tolerated medical treatment which was dorsolamide timolol combination and brimonidine she was intolerant to dimox tablets so this is the amsler sign that we saw you this patient underwent a uh, ac tap and that's when this uh, happened and the ac tap was positive for cytomegalovirus all other investigations for anterior uveitis were normal so we put her on systemic valgan cyclovir 
induction twice daily for three weeks, followed by a maintenance dose of 900 milligram once daily. She was started on topical steroids and homotropin, and the anterior uveitis is completely resolved. But the IOP remained in the 30s. The patient was counselled about the need for surgery, but she was unwilling. And since the eye was quiet, we added a prostaglandin analog. So what we found was as soon as we started bimetoprost, there was a reactivation of the anterior uveitis immediately. So you can see these KPs all over here. So this patient reactivated immediately after starting bimetoprost. So let me tell you that prostaglandin analogs are not contraindicated in a patient with uveitic glaucoma. If the patient has no active inflammation, many times they prove to be helpful and it may not lead to reactivation. But then you have to be on the watch out because certain type of uveitis, especially viral uveitis, can reactivate after starting a PG analog. So then we stopped the bimetoprast, controlled the inflammation and convinced her for a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. Her IOP has been well controlled and she has been inflammation free for the last, uh, you know, how many ever years after that. This was in 2011-12. So the last the 10 years, she has been inflammation free, luckily. So typically that doesn't happen as well. Sometimes these inflammation episodes flare up. You'll have to restart the systemic antivirals and treat them again if the pressure goes up. So it is a continued process which has to be uh, taken and the patient has to be advised about the need for follow-up immediately after they get the symptoms of inflammation. And the glaucoma department should follow them up every three monthly, just like we do with our regular patients of glaucoma. So let's go on to the other uveitic entities commonly associated with glaucoma. HLA B27 related anterior uveitis is also one which can be associated with glaucoma, ankylosing spondylitis. Sarcoidosis can also be something which is associated with open angle and sinical angle closure leading on to glaucoma. BKH syndrome. See, one should be very careful about BKH syndrome because so many times this presents as an angle closure. So you'll have a, a ciliary body swelling, which causes anterior rotation of the iris and causes angle closure. So one should be on the lookout for this kind of a thing when you're looking at a patient with uh, angle closure with ciliary body rotation. Bechet syndrome is also a cause and toxoplasma retinochoroiditis. This can also lead on to acute intraocular pressure raise. So the next important thing that we need to discuss when we are looking at uveitic glaucoma is that the treatment of uveitis itself with steroids, topical steroids and systemic steroids to a lesser extent can lead on to intraocular pressure raise. And this can cause irreversible damage to the optic nerve. So steroids are known to cause decreased facility of outflow of aqueous humor uh, in the long term. And this can happen with intraocular steroids, periocular steroids and topical steroids. And it's the least with systemic steroids. So the incidence of steroid-induced IOP raise is highest with triamcinolone and prednisolone. It is less likely with lotoprednisolone and fluoromethylone. Typically, it happens two to six weeks after starting treatment, but it can occur anytime. A patient who has been primed with a steroid response earlier, even a day after starting topical steroid, his or her pressure can go up. So it is not necessary that it needs to take two to six weeks for the IOP raise to show up. The risk factors are uh, if the patient has an unrecognized primary open angle glaucoma, if there is a family history of glaucoma, if the patient has rheumatoid arthritis, and extremes of age, young children and elderly are more likely to be steroid responders. And interestingly, diabetics also have a increased risk of being a steroid responder. So what is the pathogenesis? There are certain biochemical and morphological changes in the trabecular meshwork, which happens with long-term steroid use, which leads to increased resistance to aqueous outflow. Why does this happen? They propose that there is an accumulation of glycosaminoglycans in the trabecular meshwork, and there is an inhibition of phagocytosis by the trabecular endothelial cells, and there is an inhibition of synthesis of certain prostaglandins. And this leads to the uh, uh, dysfunction of the trabecular meshwork and the raised intraocular pressure. Initially, or in the initial phases of steroid response, it is reversible. But if this is unrecognized and the topical steroids 
are continued for a longer time, it becomes irreversible. A very unfortunate uh, uh, example of this is patients with vernal catar, where they are, take, they are given topical steroids by a local doctor or the pharmacist, and they get relief from that. And without consultation, they continue to use the topical steroids. Young children end up, end up with having secondary glaucoma with a 0.9 cup and an extremely damaged uh, disc and field. So this is something that we should be very, very aware and awareness should be there that steroids should not be used indiscriminately. So in specifically uveitis, the role of immunosuppressants and biologics now cannot be stressed more. You know, you should uh, uh, encourage uh, definitely the uveitis colleague will uh, switch over to or give you immunosuppressant cover and start biologics and other new treatments so that the dependence on steroids, either topical or injectable, is lesser and you can avoid this, uh, uh, you know, complication. The management of steroid-induced glaucoma, one can shift to a lower potency steroid or give an immunosuppressant and try to take the patient off the higher potency steroid. If there is a depot steroid, uh, subtenance depot, for example, one may need to excise that for the pressure to come down. Many a times, ozodex intravitreally can also cause raised intraocular pressure. Here, it might be an option to do vitrectomy to remove the ozodex implant. Or if the ozodex is required for the retinal pathology like cystoid macular edema or some other thing, one can even consider a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. So if all other things are not helping, doing a surgery should also be an option for the management of steroid-induced glaucoma. And uh, it's very interesting that when you have this steroid cover, the trabeculectomy also functions very well. So uh, a couple of cases which uh, I have handled where there has been intravitreal ozodex, the bleb has formed beautifully without any scarring and this can actually be a blessing. But then you can also end up in very low pressures following trabeculectomy. So this is something that you have to individualize for the patient. So this is a small flowchart. What you should remember is when you look at a uveitic glaucoma, one has to establish the cause. And here your uveitis colleague is a very, very, uh, you know, important, uh, he has an important role. So the management of the uveitis is as important as the management of the glaucoma. So as a person who is managing the glaucoma, look at the mechanism of glaucoma. Is the trabecular meshwork blocked by aqueous? That is, it is an open angle. Then, and there is, uh, you know, active inflammation. Then you have to manage the uveitis, give anti-glaucoma medication. And if uncontrolled, go on to surgical management. If there is active inflammation and trabeculitis, like in viral uh, uveitis, one has to manage the uveitis, give anti-glaucoma medications, and then go on to surgical if that doesn't help. If there is pupillary block with Iris Bombay, any amount of medical management will not help. There, the treatment is YAG-PI. And then the residual glaucoma is managed with medications. And if uncontrolled, you go on to surgical management. If it is a steroid-induced glaucoma, discontinued steroids, need for immunosuppression needs to be looked at, and then surgical management. So if there is gross peripheral anterior sinicae, angle closure, manage the uveitis, and if controlled, immediately go on to surgical management. So one has to look at the mechanism of glaucoma and the type of uveitis. So what are the considerations in medical management in a uveitic glaucoma? Generally, we use aqueous suppressants, beta blockers, or alpha-2 agonists and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Um, as I told you earlier, prostaglandin analogues are not used in active inflammation and in viral uveitis. In the other subsets, definitely they can play a role. The newer drugs such as netarsudil and ripasudil are said to be more uh, suitable for these kind of patients, but we have to see in our clinical experience if that bears out, but definitely these can be considered. Hyperosmotics and systemic acetazolamide should be used as temporary measures. Many times when the inflammation is active, you have a very high IOP where you will need to resort to systemic acetazolamide or even hyperosmotics like mannitol, but this should be a temporary measure and not a long-term measure. 
so coming to iris bombay so what happens is basically there is a pupillary block due to synechia and uh, laser iridotomy is the definitive management for this kind of a iris bombay so generally we do the yag laser in the most convex area of the iris where the iris is bulged because the iris is stretched over there and here no pre treatment is required like in our angle closure uh, uh, people and uh, we use a very low power of uh, yag laser and generally it opens with a single shot and you have to make a pi which is fairly large because it should not be closed by fibrin and many times you may need to make multiple pi's because the fluid may be loculated due to fibrin and after the pi one has to cover with topical steroids and midriatic and cycloplegic so you can see that this particular patient iris bombay it has resolved quite well the configuration has gone back to the iris becoming flat after doing the laser iridotomy so surgical management of uveitic glaucomas uh, can be by trabeculectomy with mitomycin c there is an increased risk of failure compared to trabeculectomy for the primary glaucomas but you can definitely do it with steroidal and antiviral cover and it can give you a very good iop control but the tendency has to be you ha has been to use drainage devices like the agb or the adi because they carry a better chance of success but then with the adi the chance of hypotony is higher in uveitic glaucoma so generally the amad glaucoma valve is a more preferred implant when it comes to uveitic glaucoma so let's uh, go on to another case where it shows how uh, this this kind of a complex situation is uh, treated so this was a 37 year old male patient who came for regular follow up he's been under our care since 2005 in 2005 he was diagnosed as having right eye viral keratouveitis and he has received treatment for the same he also has had secondary glaucoma and in 2006 his iop went uncontrolled with maximal medical management for which he underwent trab with mmc in 2006 so he still has had on and off recurrence with intraocular pressure spikes down the years which has been treated with topical medications and there's no other significant history so now what is his uh, treatment like in 2015 this is the situation he was on fluoromethylone brimonidine dorsolamide timolol and again tablet acetazolamide because his pressure had gone up so he has again reached the maximal medical toleration tolerance levels so on examination he had a bcv of 636 in the right eye left eye is totally normal and uh, you can see that this cornea is quite scarred due to the keratouveitis you can see this scar and there is iris atrophy because of the herpetic uh, you know uveitis he also has a cataract so posterior subcapsular cataract and no active inflammation the intraocular pressure was 35 mm of mercury the disc was 0.75 cup with inferior rim thinning and this were his feel so you can see this gross generalized depression because of the corneal opacity and the posterior subcapsular cataract and you can see this localized uh, uh, defect which correlates with the inferior rim thinning that we observed on the disc and his bcv is just about 6 by 60 the other eye is totally normal so how do we manage this patient so this patient has uncontrolled iop with maximal medical management he has a significant posterior subcapsular cataract he also has viral keratouveitis with corneal stromal scarring and vascularization and there is a previously done trap with mmc which has now failed or is not working as well so these are the preoperative considerations so what we did was to start the patient on oral tablet valacyclovir after renal function test because it, this is a proven herpetic keratouveitis and we planned a phaco with iol with an egb implant because a repeat trap is not likely to work very well in this patient and given that he also has a cataract one might as well go ahead and remove the cataract because this patient is a quiet eye has a quiet eye for a, 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 a reasonable period of time which is greater than 6 months so post op we also plan to give acyclovir i ointment along with the topical steroids because of the risk of reactivation of the uh, keratitis with topical steroids so we could not use the care readings of this affected eye so we used the care readings of the other normal eye along with the axial length and planned the iol 
The specular microscopy showed uh, a reasonable endothelial count. So that is good. And uh, that is definitely encouraging. So this is the surgery which we performed. So a traction suture was placed. And you can see the conjunctiva being dissected here superotemporally. This is the site of the previous trap. And uh, so you can see the valve being primed and the, uh, uh, the sutures being placed on the eyelets of the uh, AGV valve. And then the valve is inserted into the, uh, uh, the dissected area back uh, be behind the limbus, at least about nine millimeters behind the limbus, the plate should be located. And it is sutured to the sclera the pre-placed eyelet sutures are anchored. And now, because this cornea has such low visibility, what we did was to use a chandelier technique, like illuminate from behind. Uh, a chandelier is placed in a parsplena pore, and that illumination is used for your visualization. So after doing the uh, side openings, we have released the sinicae and dilated the pupil with a highly retentive viscoelastic. And then we are placing a malugin ring to dilate the pupil. So you can see that it's a very complex cataract to handle as well. So this uh, requires uh, a lot of uh, you know, skill and uh, collaboration with your, with your retina and other colleagues so that you can manage the case effectively. So now the chandelier is being inserted into the parse plane entry. And you can see that with the chandelier illumination, one toggles between the chandelier illumination and the microscope illumination. And one can visualize the uh, cataract uh, procedure a little better than one would have with just a microscope illumination. And you can see now that the foldable IOM is being inserted into the eye. And then the malugin ring is uh, removed from the eye. And then the cataract wound is uh, sutured preferably. And then the valve procedure is now completed. So you had anchored the tube, uh, the plate before the cataract procedure was started. Now we trim the tube for to adequate length, make an entry into the AC, take care not to be close to the endothelium, direct your entry towards the center of the pupil posteriorly so that the tube is not directed anteriorly. Anchor the tube and then place a scleral patch graft. So here I'm using fibrin glue to uh, adhere. Here we are using clear cornea, corneal uh, donor cornea, which was there is being used. And then the conjunctiva is also being uh, closed with the uh, uh, fibrin glue as well. So you can see that uh, this kind of a thing uh, actually helps. And this patient subsequently, it's from 2015, has been doing well. He's had a few reactivations of the viral uveitis, but then the valve is working well and his eye pressure remains under very good control. So to conclude, what is the key to managing uh, inflammatory glaucoma? Early detection, identifying the mechanism, effectively treating the underlying cause, and managing the IOP appropriately, looking at what is happening in a particular patient. So don't go by names, don't go by Posner schlossmann syndrome, don't go by you know, it is useful to categorize these patients, but think as to what is happening in this patient. Was it what is causing raised intraocular pressure? Is it open angle mechanism? Is it angle closure mechanism? How much of sinicae are there? Is there any steroid induced response? So think about the mechanism for each particular patient and manage the IOP appropriately. Monitor the disc and fields as you would for a primary glaucoma. Many times we forget to document the disc and fields in patients with secondary glaucoma, that should not be done. Collaborate with a UVIT specialist and many times the retina specialist as well. And educate the patient. When the patient ends up going to multiple subspecialists, a glaucoma specialist, a UVI specialist, a retina specialist, sometimes they get very confused as to what is exactly happening. And so you need to be very, very clear and educate the patient about your role in the management. If you are looking at the intraocular pressure and managing that, Educate the patient about that and tell them that your other colleague will clarify about, you know, the risk of reactivation and the retinal consequences. So one should make a definite, uh, you know, attempt to educate the patient. And with this, you can effectively manage this 
uveitic glaucoma, which is an important cause of visual morbidity in patients with uveitis. So thank you very much. And I've spoken for a quite a long time. I hope it was not boring. And I am open to all questions and uh, any inputs that the panel may have. Thank you. Not at all boring, Gauri. <laughs> very interesting. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, you know, it, it, this is a very difficult subject and it's so vast. And, uh, you know, I feel that um, glaucomas associated with ocular inflammation are by far the most difficult to detect because they don't come to you only. They go to yeah. various different departments, which is a point you made very, very clearly. I can, you know, off the top of my hat, you know, think of two cases immediately. One where a, pay, a young patient, 20, 22 year old, who was being treated for intermediate uveitis because the patient had CME. Mm. And he also received a depot steroid, which got, gave mm. him steroid induced glaucoma, but mm. did not see the periphery. The patient had RP. Oh. And oh. CME was associated with that RP. Oh, and, okay. and, you know, went through the whole cycle of problems and, you know, uh, you know, I ultimately did a trap, trap has worked, but, you know, shouldn't have come to that. Or another one where, you know, I inherited this patient as I moved to a center for sight and was documented as Posner Schlossman or glaucomatocyclitic mm -hmm. crisis, whatever you want to call it. And uh, when I look at it, I see, uh, you know, the eye is quiet and everything, but the patient had glaucoma. So the patient underwent trabeculectomy because the uh, pressures were not controlled and patient was getting definite halos uh, with high pressures. So uh, nonetheless, after, because it wasn't documented as viral and did not have signs of any uveitis at the time of trabeculectomy, what happened was uh, after surgery, obviously antiviral cover was not given because of the precedent uh, mm -hmm. findings, patients mm -hmm. started getting recurrent anterior uveitis and mm -hmm. looked, looked very much viral. And so now the trab is failing, patient has developed a cataract. So it's just a, you know, it's a roller ball, isn't it? You know, it just keeps, it just yeah. keeps coming. But thank you very much. That was really very well uh, illustrated, you know, with cases. I really enjoyed it. At this point, I do invite both uh, the chair and the co-chair to give their impressions. Thank you, Vanita. And uh, thank you, Gauri, for such a wonderful talk. That was really beautiful. Thank I you, sir. You did manage to cover everything, uh, which is, like Vanita rightly said, very tough. Uh, some of the points uh, which you have already made, I would like to for the PGs to do. And for one is definitely for the PGs that the PGs can be used. So the prostaglandin <laughs> can be used, and yeah. uh, which you very rightly pointed out. And though you had shown a case where it uh, recurred mm -hmm. uh, that, but yes, and you rightly said, but please let me reiterate that don't worry if it's not an active case, you can start that. Because we get so many queries yeah. on that point. Second true, point, true. Uh, again, which has been made, uh, but you have to be careful to uh, teach the patient that what happens is they get so fed up that we know, yeah, steroid use karenge, so let us start steroid by ourselves. Correct, so, correct. so many a times we have to actually, every person of such, I sit down and tell them, all right, I know that you get fed up, you don't want to come sometimes, then you'll be starting. Suppose you're in a place you can't come. Whenever you do start steroids, start anti glaucoma also along with them. So you can make some kind of package for them that many a time they will not come up. So at least they can start both the drugs instead of only starting steroids. Mm -hmm. Then uh, one very important thing, obviously I always speak that <laughs> it is too close to my heart that when you are doing the like tree, <coughs> Gauri rightly said, do multiple PIs. So in that PI, on either side of the PI, with the YAG PI, uh, use your argon uh, stretch to stretch out that. And that usually works very well. Mm -hmm. And also the iridolenticular synecolysis. <coughs> if you don't want to do the whole bit, at least uh, like in both the cases which uh, Gauri was showing, the pupil is stuck up on the lens. So you can actually use very gentle YAG spots of 0.5 millijoule to cut up some of those areas so that even when the PI is closed, those areas can keep filtering 
uh, mm -hmm. keep uh, passing the aquas so that we don't go into aquas uh, in the Iris Bombay. And uh, uh, like Vanita shared, I also want to, uh, uh, just yesterday we were uh, discussing a case which was, uh, since my son is uh, doing vitreal retina, so we have this <laughs> whole discussion in the night on food, not on movies, but on the cases. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> what uh, happened was there was a there was a diagnosed case of BKH, supposedly, who was not responding. I will not name the institutions, but for six months, the patient was being treated, treated, uh, and uh, was on steroids, not responding. And then it went to him and uh, they were very worried that something is not right somewhere, though nothing was seeming abnormal. Then on a lot of questioning, that lady came up with a, a fact that she had a breast module around five years back, which was nothing. Ultimately, it was a benign this thing and nothing happened on that. So they sent them back. And can you believe it? The PT scan has shown the entire body filled up. And the eye was filled up with a tumor. So sometimes, and they are sitting on it for a long time. So we have to please, please, in all slightly unusual things, do think of uh, carcinoma mm -hmm. because they have become so common. They have become commoner than even tuberculosis, it seems to me. Every day, we all in our families, somewhere or the other distant, are having this. So thank you, Gauri, again. And Pratik, please go ahead. Thank you, Gauri. It was uh, really a wonderful talk. Thank you. you know, the, the best part of your talk is that, you know, the most uh, difficult triad is the uveitis, prostaglandin analog, and the steroid. You know, that you have explained very well because it confuses everyone whether to use a steroid or not to use a steroid in these patients. You explained wonderfully. Whether to use PG analog or not to use PG analog, you explained it wonderfully. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, you have mentioned repeatedly that, okay, uh, the PCR is very helpful, uh, but unfortunately, you know, uh, most of us in our armamentarium, we don't have the facility and we don't include uh, uh, the PCR test uh, uh, for the, you know, whole battery of investigation when we offer for the patient. So that is not included. And I, I, I realize that that is uh, pretty important because in mm. some of your patient, uh, you may prevent the recurrence of uveitis and uh, you can save the eye. The best part, the case you showed <laughs> is the chandelier <laughs> illumination and <laughs> management of the mm. corneal scar. Uh, that was beautifully done. Okay, so we don't have that facility and we are using the retroillumination, but uh, yeah. uh, after seeing your patient, yes, uh, I, I feel that uh, that is much, much, much better technique if you, if you can use it. Uh, otherwise, the retroillumination also works uh, with, even with the yeah. pretty dense corneal scar and all. Uh, yes, uh, in our country, we see a lot many patients uh, with tuberculosis and uh, uveitis and secondary glaucoma. So that also we have to keep in mind and uh, we also have to keep the multidisciplinary approach and we have to involve many a time the pulmonologist, the rheumatologist uh, and the physician uh, to take care of these patients. So all the PGs should keep that thing in their mind that, that uh, the uveitis is not at all a simple uh, play, a simple game to play. It's a very, very difficult thing to manage. And uh, once you have a complicated case with cataract and secondary glaucoma, it's very difficult to manage these patients many a time. But yes, after listening to your talk, even I feel confident that yes, we should be able to manage uh, most of these patients comfortably. And uh, Harsh always talks about uh, uh, the laser treatment and you know, still uh, I become apprehensive when I have to release the uh, lenticular anterior sinuses. <laughs> 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 I know. I, I do not think this is for PGs. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, very, very difficult thing. You have to anteriorly uh, defocus that uh, you must realize and then only you can release and uh, the multiple PIES uh, that is uh, wonderfully explained by you and uh, re-emphasized by Dr. Harsh. So excellent, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right. Only one have... question, you know, I yeah, want sorry, to ask sorry. you that, you know, uh, yes, sir. PG analog, uh, 
oh no we are using pg analog to reduce the pressure okay mm. but in uh, uvid patients uh, the prostaglandin is responsible to raise the intraocular mm. 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 how would you explain it? So, so these are hypotheses which have been given the exact mechanism which pg prostaglandin is released in the eye and which type of glaucoma these are things which are very variable and in a particular patient how much each mechanism is contributing to the iop raise how much is the pg associated inflammation contributing how much is it scarring of the meshwork how much is it decreased facility of outflow due to some synecha so these are all variable so one cannot simply say that uh, i think it's an oversimplification that since pg and prostaglandins are implicated in the pathogenesis we should not give pg analogs pg analogs increase the uvo scleral outflow prostamides also increase uvo scleral outflow so that has a role to play but definitely in each case you will have to individualize so there are certain uvitis where the secondary glaucomas where they don't respond to pg analog and in fact the pressure goes up so probably in such patients the uh, prostaglandin may be a positive factor for the raised in inflammation so uh, use it when the eye is quiet that is the first thing don't use it when the uveitis is active and second don't keep it as the first treatment of choice in viral uveitis mm -hmm. and once you use it look at the response in that particular patient and then decide whether you are going to continue it or not continue it so that is how one would approach it in a clinical way sir but yes as you mentioned it looks a little contradictory that we are using prostaglandins where it has been implicated in the positive uh, role for you uh, get right that you know we have uh, two types of pg analog one is pg e2 and other is pg f2 alpha, alpha. and pg e2 is responsible mm -hmm. for uh, increasing the iop and wherever you yeah. have a pg e2 the pressure uh, spike you will see mm -hmm. is is, mm -hmm. is Is that that could also is be a factor, sir. Definitely, sir. That could be. But I'm saying that what is actually happening in a particular patient, we can only hypothesize and we can't prove beyond uh, doubt. And the I, NSAID versus the yes, the, that uh, that is most important. Actually, I feel that a non-steroidal uh, should not be used along with a PG analog because PG you analog, are like yeah, a nepapinac yeah. or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Agreed. that i have seen many times and have had to reverse right there are a few questions if you don't mind <laughs> yes ma'am yes. so there's a uh, the question from dr keerthana she is asking what mm. agm uh, will you advise in cases of a steroid induced glaucoma that can be used for temporary measure and for how long it should be given and how should it be tapered okay so essentially you can use uh, 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 eye drops which decrease the aqueous inflow like timolol dorsolamide or brinzolamide and the uh, drops which can increase the outflow like brimonidine as well and temporarily you can even give acetazolamide tablet dimox and if there is a very high iop like you know the patient has been putting steroids and comes to you unrecognized pressure is 50 you can even give them manitol iv manitol to decrease the pressure so this is a temporary measure this manitol and glycerol oral glycerol you can maximum give it once or twice and not more than that oral glycerol probably you can give it a couple of days the uh, topical anti glaucoma medications like timolol dorsolamide or brinzolamide and brimonidine you can give for a little longer and once the steroid is withdrawn and the iop uh, low, lowers down you can start taking away the agm one by one so one by one you can reduce it and you can see whether you can take the patient off all the medications that you had started earlier ah there is increasing evidence that even brimonidine can cause mm. inflammation uveitis yes 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 that's something that i did not mention in my talk mm. but brimonidine definitely has been implicated in the causation of a granulomatous uveitis so mm. keep that in mind again that doesn't happen to all patients one clinical clue is that the topical allergy that is your follicle formation your papillae on the upper tarsal conjunctiva these are also there when you have the uveitis so you have to be wary of the allergic uh, you know uh, changes which are associated with brimonidine and if there is a uveitis uh, uh, which does not you know go away and the patient is on brimonidine one might actually take off the brimonidine and see if it actually subsides the inflammation 
many times you would be surprised to see that actually bromonidine is causing the uveitis. Right. Okay. Some uh, Fuchs related questions now. Uh, there's a question which is asking what is the cause of uh, that new vascularization in the angle in Fuchs? Is there a cause? The, the, uh, the low grade inflammation and uh, the, the blood ocular barrier being uh, compromised, this leads to the new blood vessels, fine new blood vessels which come there. And uh, the pukes is an entity which has been in definition since a very long time. So with the advent of PCR, many of these pukes, uh, heterochromic iridocyclitis, we can actually demonstrate a viral etiology for it. So one needs to keep that in mind. Don't just bracket patients as Fuchs and posner schlossman syndrome. Many times with the PCR, you can actually demonstrate a viral etiology and treating the cause will actually help you in managing the, uh, the, the glaucoma and the uveitis more effectively. It is neovascularization, which is associated with any uveitis. Typically in Fuchs, you have these fine new blood vessels you can't even see. But when you do gonioscopy or you do paracentesis, they bleed. And you can see that small microhyphema in the eye. And sometimes when it's not recognized and you have this uh, a cataract surgery in a non-senile cataract situation, then you may end up with a hyphema. Mm. Then, then people, True. you know, back calculate. Mm. But um, mm. the other question related to Fuchs is, do you need to avoid prostaglandin analogs, given that you get, uh, you know, uh, pigmentation associated problems. Is there? Uh... Uh, no, I, I would not avoid prostaglandin analogs for the pigmentation. Really. Uh, I think what they are talking about is that increased iris pigmentation, which is a side effect yes. of prostaglandin yes. analogs. Yes. I don't think that is any having any relationship to the inflammatory component. So that will not be the cause for my avoiding the PGA. But uh, is it masking have, the heterochromia, so to speak? It could, but then I would not take that as a, a problem if it manages the IOP effectively. So uh, the thing is the inflammation should not worsen following the PG analogs and the UVIT should not be active. So those are the two things that I would look at and not these things. So you, well, they don't then our irises are very hyperpigmented. So uh, I don't think uh, we will have any you know, very marked change in the iris. So the inevitable question, do you do PCR in all cases of suspected viral uveitis? Yeah, yeah. We, in do. our hospital, we do. We do the Fuchs profile for all cases where even posner schlossman syndrome, if it is a repeated one, not for the first episode, yeah. if there is a repeated occurrence of posner schlossman we do a PCR. Right. So uh, is it uh, you who do the AC tap and uh, send the sample away or... The uvia colleague takes care of that. Ah, okay. Hmm. All right. Um, and um, that should be done before the patient is started on steroids, as soon as the patient is seen. So if the right. patient is already started on, presentation. on steroids, on presentation. If the patient is already on steroids, then the yield becomes lesser. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and how long would you do oral antivirals Say you've done surgery, uh, that, surgery for a patient. Yeah, yeah. How long mm -hmm. and at what dose? Uh, so this one, I would leave it to my uvia colleague to decide. Because they give, as I mentioned in that case, which I presented an induction dose, which is a BD dosage for about a week or two. And then they maintain on an OD dosage in valacyclovir about 800 milligram OD for a long period of time, maybe a month or two. And uh, gancyclovir for CMV, we give it for even longer. So I think that is left to the uvia colleague and uh, they follow various protocols and I don't get very much involved in that. But definitely they may need to be given a, 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 you know, medium to fairly long term for such patients. We are giving uh, acivir, acyclovir, uh, 800, yeah. 800 milligrams five times for at least three mm. months. Mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. here. So, I don't know uh, whether, you know. Sorry, Vinita, just uh, Gauri said that uh, the uh, yield becomes very less when we, uh, but which uveitis patient would you get who is not on steroids? Uh, who yeah, in a, they, in a if if, if they are patient. on on that, on that steroids at that particular instance, don't do a PCR then. You treat it, manage it. Once it becomes quiet, when they come with a reactivation to you, that mm -hmm. is when you take the ACTAP. 
So, so you don't take it. Uh, okay, don't that, take it at that time. Yeah. So you yeah. good to clarify that. Yeah. Do you advise the battery of investigation at the first visit uh, uh, on the first episode or uh, you advise the most of the investigation on the uh, recurrence? Uh, most of it is on the recurrence. Yeah. But if it is a typical fugue where it has been going on for a while, where the patient has not realized or you know just treated with steroids, but it's fairly long term, we can already see secondary glaucoma changes. I think at the first instance itself, it is better to investigate and be clear about the uh, uveitis and the the uh, causes for the uveitis uh, depends on the uh, patient the setting of the patient his 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 or her history clinical associations and the uveitis so clear cut joint pains younger patient slightly you know kyphosis bent person who presents with anterior uveitis you know that ankylosing spondylitis may be a cause so you 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 know the meshing concept that the uvia people use to order investigations you can use that but generally the first episode maybe you will not be too aggressive and once you know that this is recurring you go the full hog in investigating right for tuberculosis on 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 test is most critical to diagnose the tubercular uveitis is the montu yeah. test uh, you believe or the tuberculosis tuberculous. interferon or tb go test What test mm, you rely sir, on? Sir, this varies. Uh, see, some patients, uh, even a bronchial lavage has been done by uh, you know our pulmonologist colleagues because when we are very strongly suspecting, the pulmonologist will not treat just based on a Montu or a Pontiferon TB gold, no, and true. we are saying that this uveitis may be related to tuberculosis. There's a little degree of hesitancy. So sometimes even the pulmonologist had gone and done a bronchoalveolar lavage and then. that has been subjected to tests and then proven tuberculosis and then treated but nowadays they are more amenable to treat with uh, you know because the therapeutic response is quite good so the uvia colleague speaks with the pulmonologist and then uh, we can treat with even a mantu and a pontiferon tb gold if the clinical picture in the eye is very suggestive of ocular tuberculosis well you would have a certain amount of posterior uveitis also uh, yeah. in yeah. in yeah. tuberculosis right and um, well uh, uh, non valved uh, tubes are notorious or yeah. had the reputation of causing hypotony in uveitis but um, hypotony can occur in and uh, in i'm a doctor of valve also uh, especially when you know uh, post operatively they go into a ciliary shutdown and yes. you never know how long that shutdown is going to last uh, i had my fingers burnt once uh, i did agv for a patient and a uveitic patient who already had a trap somewhere else mm. and um, she had shallow ac and you know uh, not just shallow almost flat ac so i had to go in and reform and then i now routinely partially ligate an agv tube in uveitics also oh okay Okay. and okay. and it has it has worked very well so you know you learn from your own mistakes i suppose <laughs> true, true yeah um any further comments dr harsh i mean this was a great discussion i really enjoyed it uh any further comments oh, thank you very much i think we must thank gori Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thanks, your... Vanita. Thanks, Dr. Pratib, Dr. Harsh. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed the discussion. Enjoyed well. Thank you very much, Gauri. We really, really thank you for your lovely. effort, your time. Uh, My thank pleasure. Thank you so much. Yes, T- Team CFS is very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, I think today what I'm going to do with the uh, hot seaters is uh, just about. um but i usually uh, put some questions to the hot seaters today okay. i just give them a, i just give them a top tip just keeps keeps them awake <laughs> you're more than welcome to leave if you want to you don't have to hang around yeah i'll stay i'll hear <laughs> so um the first first tip and that it was given uh, uh, you know uh, made clear extremely well but i would like to reiterate because i've seen so many being done and that is uh, related to um pi the concept of pi in the angle closure that happens in uveitis basically 
Right. So PI is useful only if in secondary situations, there is a pupillary block. In other words, what we are saying is there is a 360 degree occlusio pupillae, meaning there is no way that the aqueous from the posterior segment or posterior chamber, sorry, can escape into the anterior chamber and then leave via the trabecular meshwork. Yes, in this scenario, you may also have uh, synechy in the angle. There is no doubt about that, that you will have. But unless you see a, an occlusio pupillae, something like that, this is actually, unfortunately, a very advanced case where pass has also occurred uh, right at the mid peripheral cornea because it has not been either not been recognized or the patient presented very late. And same here. Here there is a membrane as well in front of the pupil, which is causing. So this is a typical, this is known as iris bombay. What we mean by iris bombay is a peripheral ballooning of the iris with a centrally deep anterior chamber, something like that. And this is exactly the picture Dr. Gauri Murthy also showed. So you have a deep anterior chamber, but a ballooning of the iris peripherally, right? So what do you do in such cases? Sorry. There, you can see the... Uh, the diagrammatic representation of the same. Why it is deep centrally and why it is shallow peripherally. And it is this ballooning, which is known as Iris Bombay. So what you need to do is flatten that. How do you flatten that? By doing a LPI. So this is a post-operative case where you can see, it's not very clear, but you can still see that ballooning of the peripheral iris and a deep uh, central anterior chamber, okay? The reason being that the pupil is stuck down to the IOL as well, as a result of which the aqueous cannot escape from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber and then go via the trabecular meshwork. In these kind of cases, you will do a PI. And where do you do it? In the most ballooned part of the Iris. And you, you generally have to do multiple. Doing one can close it off very quickly, very easily. You can see how it has flattened. That peripheral iris becomes flattened, so you have resolution of the iris bombay situation. What I find most of the times is that patients, in spite of having a pupillary reaction, if you have a pupillary reaction, obviously your pupil is not stuck down. In spite of having that, they have a PI. Why? Because they have synechy in the angle. If they have synechy in the angle, in secondary situations, it is not going to help. What you need to have is a pupillary block. Okay, secondary pupillary block. And LPI is indicated only, only indicated in secondary pupillary block. You're, it is not indicated when you see synechy in the angle. In uveitic cases, obviously, it will be unilateral. Most of the time, uveitis is unilateral. So if you're not seeing changes in the uh, fallow eye, you're obviously not dealing with a primary situation. Okay, I think I will, I will stop there. Um, I uh, will bring you many, many more uh, cases through the next few weeks. But um, uh, there was one particular case that really upset me this week, and that was a highly myopic patient underwent cataract surgery, underwent capsular polishing, has been seen by ophthalmologists right from 2001 to 2021. And there is documentation that the patient has been seen with the dates and with the retina picture that there is not a single IOP recording from 2001 to 2021. That really upset me. Why? Because the patient today has such advanced glaucoma. In the right eye, he has some vision, 20 hundred. In the left eye, he's almost completely lost, lost complete vision. 
So it's not just about uh, recording the pressure, it's about suspecting that the patient could have glaucoma. High myopes, you must, you know, even if you err on the side of caution, nobody is going to raise fingers. But these are the cases which tend to have glaucoma. And these are the ones, unfortunately, who, you know, uh, are, you know, um, are missed quite, quite easily because the concentration on other uh, comorbidities rather than the glaucoma itself. So I will bring that case to you as well as soon as I have all the relevant pictures. And uh, is there anything else you guys want to ask today to clarify? Please go ahead. Dr. Soni, Dr. Veer, uh, Dr. Praveen, if you guys are still there. Anything that, that uh, still uh, is not clear enough for you guys? Well, there is silence on their part, so uh, this it's time to... Hello? Uh, Ma'am, how long to follow up for a case of UIT glaucoma uh, as an acute setting? We treated it, uh, uh, then how long to follow up for IOP uh, spikes, ma'am? Or only when the next episode comes to suspect or uh, we need to no. follow up OP? If they have only ocular hypertension and the hypertension resolves, that's fine. Then you have the luxury. I don't think uh, once glaucoma sets in, you have to just follow your glaucoma protocol after that. There is no way you can ask the patient to stop coming for a uh, regular intraocular pressure check and annual if you know, uh, if more is required, of course you do more, but at least annual visual field test. Okay. All right. Okay, ma'am. Any further questions? No? Okay. Fine. Time to say good night. We'll see you next week with another episode in the glaucoma module. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you.